So we've been looking at Descartes' meditations, and at the end of our previous video, we were at the end of meditation too. Descartes thinks uh, he can be certain that he exists, he can be certain that he thinks, he can be certain that he uh, about the contents of his mind, and he can inspect his ideas, but there's a question, um, you know, are his ideas certain? Maybe they're put there by an evil demon. What's going on, right? Hat and, and what about our senses, right? Still, can we use our senses to come to knowledge? Who knows? as a meditation too. So in meditation three and later, Descartes gonna say, actually, yes, we can trust our inspection of our ideas and we can trust our senses. So how is he gonna do that? He thinks that we can know a priori that God exists. That's how he's gonna do it. So if we remember from the very beginning of the class, uh, we had a teleological argument from Paley. Paley says, uh, I, the world has, the physical world has this wonderful, uh, complex, good organization, and the only thing that could have created that uh, is God, and so God exists, or something, right? That's a, not the argument in full detail. Well, if you remember back to the beginning of the class, we had a teleological argument coming, for example, from Paley. Paley says the world has good uh, complexity. Either the that complexity comes from uh, a perfect being, or it's the world is a huge coincidence, and the world and and huge coincidences are very unlikely, and therefore it's highly likely that the world is created by this perfect being. Well, that first premise is that the world has good organization. Descartes not in a position to uh, use that premise because that premise relies uh, on thinking that we know about how well the world is organized. But as of this point in meditation too, we don't even know that there is a physical world, let alone how well organized it is. And so Descartes can't use this argument because it relies on sensory evidence. So Descartes doesn't make this argument. Instead, he offers two other arguments. He says, uh, first one is, I have the idea of a perfect infinite being. He thinks he knows that through inspection of his own ideas. And he thinks that only a perfect infinite being could create the idea of a perfect infinite being. And so given that he has this idea of a perfect infinite being, there must be a perfect infinite being. And I wonder really why can only a perfect infinite being create such an idea? Well, go read Meditations 3 uh, if you want to. Uh, it's an interesting argument. Second argument for God's existence, Descartes says, I am finite and imperfect. True enough, only a perfect after all. I'm having trouble even knowing any, knowing very much. That's a huge limitation. Second premise, only a perfect infinite being could create a finite imperfect being, and therefore there is a perfect infinite being. Why does he believe that? Well, again, we'd have to go look at Meditation 3 in more detail than we have time for. But these are Descartes' two arguments for God's existence, and Descartes thinks that they both succeed, and he thinks that they're both a priori, that he can know them just by in by uh, this internal process of reasoning. And he thinks, and this is very tricky, uh, there's there's a lot of debate about this, that he could, that his knowledge of these premises is not dependent on, or is, is not uh, subject to the demon doubt, that the evil genius could not deceive him about these premises. And you might wonder, really, why is that? Again, that's a good question, and it's not obvious that Descartes has an answer. He talks about clear and distinct ideas and so on. If we had time, we would talk about it. We don't. Descartes thinks that he can prove through the use of reason that God exists and, and God understood as a perfect creator being. And so there are two big doubts about these arguments. One is, are they good arguments in general? And then uh, even if we might think there may be good arguments in general, we might wonder, well, could an evil genius deceive us about them? Descartes has things to say about this, and you can look in the med in meditations uh, four and five if you want. There are interesting uh, uh, issues that are raised there. It's complicated, and we're not going to try to resolve them right now. So if Descartes is right, though, that he can know that there's a perfect being, then he thinks he can know in particular that he can know a priori that the being that created him is not a deceiver. So this is pretty plausible, right? Uh, we're just thinking about the problem of evil here. If, uh, if God were a deceiver, that would be a whole lot of evil that God would have created. God doesn't do that, right? And if this God exists, it's created Descartes, it's created Descartes' ideas, it's created the world, it's created Descartes' sensory organs and so on. And if God rigged up the world so that the sensory organs were consistently inaccurate, produced inaccurate sensory perceptions, then um, God would be a deceiver. And a perfect being is not a deceiver. So why does reason work? 
why does our thinking work to get us accurate beliefs? Because God has put accurate ideas into my mind, and God has given me the ability to understand them, so that when I inspect them, uh, I will in fact come to the truth about uh, what those ideas are about. When I inspect my idea of body or space or point or line or number or equals or plus, I come to correct conclusions about one plus one or about how many numbers there are or about the Pythagorean theorem or about bodies being extended and changeable and flexible. All those examples we saw from the previous video. God has given me accurate ideas of what points and lines in space are like and the ability to understand those ideas. And so when I inspect them, I come to true conclusions. What about sensory knowledge? Well, let's think about this. If we, we have good reason to believe that God is not a deceiver, right? Being a deceiver would be an imperfection, so that's out because God's a perfect being. God is not a deceiver. And, well, what does that mean? It means that, among other things, right, if my sense perception that I have a body and that there are other things, those are certain. God would be a deceiver, right? God has given me this, uh, I always, 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 sort of have sensory experiences of my body and that there are other bodies um, besides my own body. If those were all inaccurate, that would mean that God had given me radically flawed uh, sensory organs uh, and brain activity, and um, that would make God a deceiver. So if God isn't a deceiver, then my sense perceptions that I have a body and that there are other bodies are certain. And, some, and God isn't a deceiver, and that means that I can be certain that I have a body, and that there are other bodies. And so we can now discard, uh, see where Descartes is really uh, getting away from the argument of the first meditations. We know he already disagreed with the first premise because he said, look, um, there are things I know that don't involve sensory perception at all, like I exist. But now he's also said, look, given that I know that God exists, and that God is not a deceiver, which I can know by inspecting my ideas and reasoning, I can understand that my senses are not deceptive, and if they're not deceptive, then uh, among other things, they are providing me, uh, I can be certain that I do have a body, uh, and my sensory perceptions that I have a body are certain, the sensory perceptions that there are other bodies are certain, not all the time and in every case, right, but just that there are other bodies at all, yes. So in fact, there are things on Descartes' view from the senses that are completely certain and are undoubtable. But to know that, we need to know how, uh, where our sensory organs came from, what created them. And what created them on his view was God who is not a deceiver. And so it's our, it's our reasoned uh, knowledge of God's existence that gives us uh, confidence to believe in the deliverance of the senses, to believe in all, to trust all of our sensory perceptions, because they are effectively coming to us from God. And so, hooray, Descartes can know, among other things, that he's sitting by the fire. Of course, he's happy that he knows this. What he really cares about is um, why he's writing the meditations is so that we can get on with physics and geometry and astronomy and all that and discover all sorts of new things and not just know that we're sitting by the fire. That's nice, but that's not all he cares about. But it is nice that he can come back to the beginning of the meditations and say, yes, I do know why I'm sitting by the fire because I have these sense perceptions of doing so and they were given to me by God whose existence I can be certain of because I know that I and my ideas of God uh, couldn't exist without also God's existing. So on Descartes' view of knowledge, then, there are really sort of two important faculties. There's reason and there's perception. Reason allows us to know things like I exist, geometry, mathematics, God exists, God's not a deceiver, and my mind. With that knowledge, I can combine what I know from reason with what I get from perception to know things like I'm sitting by the fire and physics and astronomy. And so what I know from reason, that's called a priori knowledge because it's prior to sensory perception, whereas the other stuff, I'm sitting by the fire, physics, astronomy, that's called a posteriori knowledge because it's posterior to or after or consequent on having sensory perception. So that's Descartes' view. This is a form of what's called rationalism. Rationalism holds that reason is a very important source of knowledge, both uh, independently of sensory perception and supporting sensory perception, right? With Descartes, uh, we have knowledge of our mind, of mathematics, of geometry, independently of sensory perception, and then we need to know, uh, for, in Descartes' view, how do we know that our sensory perception, our sensory organs are reliable and that sensory perception is getting it right because we know how it was, how those things were created and how do we know how they were, they were created by reasoning about them.
So this is philosophy. There's lots of controversy. Very few rationalists agree with Descartes on a lot of this stuff, but the basic idea that, okay, reason provides us both knowledge independent of sense perception and plays a role in us getting knowledge from sense perception, that those basic ideas are rationalism in epistemology in the theory of knowledge. There's also rationalism way back in ethics. If we think about Kant, we remember what's his big thing? Well, it's the categorical imperative. I should act only on that maxim that I can at the same time will to be a universal law. I should treat others as ends and not just as means. Kant thinks that reason is what allows us to recognize the truth of the categorical imperative, and that recognition is what motivates us to act on it. So for Kant, reason is really important in, um, in ethics because it's the fundamental... Um, Ethical principles are principles that are discovered by reason, and their discovery by reason is what moves us to act. Whereas for Mill, Mill's really more of an empiricist. Had what's important? Pleasure and pain, so sensation. And um, oh, right, and for Kant, what are we supposed to respect? Other people's rationality, their autonomy, their ability to make sort of rational decisions for themselves. That's what's valuable. Whereas for Mill, what's valuable is pleasure and pain, happiness and suffering. So much more sort of sensory. Um, phenomenon. And what motivates us? Feelings, not thoughts and reasoning, but feelings of love and benevolence and altruism and care for others. And so for Kant, it's Kant's very much focused on the role of reason in ethics as what's valuable, as what allows us to understand what's valuable and what motivates us. Whereas for Mill, what's valuable and what allows us to understand what's valuable and motivates us is all uh, about feeling love and pain and, and pleasure and happiness and suffering and all of that. And so we have this rationalist empiricist divide in ethics as well as in epistemology. Now, this idea that um, Descartes then has, he can know a priori that God's a deceiver, that's the key sort of element, the rationalist, key rationalist element of his explanation of how it is that we uh, know that there's a physical world, that there's an external world. And you might think, well, I don't agree with Descartes' proof of the existence of God, or I don't think that it works in the presence of an evil genius. Maybe the evil genius could be deceiving him about the quality of those arguments for the existence of God. Reasonable enough. But then we're confronted with this question, which arises for um, most anybody who's thinking about these issues. I have some basic methods of what I take to be knowing. Maybe it's reason, maybe it's sense perception, imagination, memory, whatever. How do I know that they're any good? How do I know that they work? Yeah. And Descartes has an answer. We've looked at part of it. It involves knowing that God created him. And if you don't agree with that answer, then you have a question. How do you know instead if it's not, um, if it's not God that did it? And we'll look briefly in the next video at the... Uh, answer that's provided by a rather different philosopher, the philosopher John Locke, and you can think about whether or not you find his answer satisfactory.